And of course, happening next on stage, we'll be inviting our second speaker up, and he is none other than Captain William Francis, President of the Singapore Power Boat Association. He will be sharing his experience through his presentation called Observance of Good Seamanship. Captain William, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, fellow boaters. May I um, see by a show of hands those people that have at least owned a power boat, a pleasure craft, at least once in their life? Just a show of hands. How many people still playing with their pleasure crafts? Okay, good. Thank you very much. Uh, Roy, welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow boaters, I love the sea, and I'm sure, likewise, everyone here. I'm happiest when I'm out at sea. My picture of bliss, just like my good friend, Mr. Donald Kratt, my picture of bliss is being anchored in a mirror calm bay off an exotic island with my boating car keys, watching the sunset over a can of beer, Life's better with boating, don't you think so? But like Richard has shown us in great detail, things can go very wrong. And usually when accidents happen, the inventory of rules and regulations, restrictions and prohibitions tend to also increase. And that's sad. I'm a staunch believer in the freedom of the seas for every citizen. I'm all for the minimization of restrictions and prohibitions governing its use, particularly for recreational boaters. So when the same accidents, unfortunately when the same accidents happen again and again, as Richard has shown us, government bodies are expected to take action to prevent those mishaps and promote safety at sea. It is for this reason that the Pleasure Craft Safety Work Group was formed, headed by Captain Charles D'Souza from the MPA. Would you like to take a stand, Captain Charles? <laughs> Although everyone knows you here. <laughs> and the deputy for this work group is the Honorable Mr. YP Lok. YP, would you like to take a stand? And we had the pleasure recently of being on board YP's um, sailing yacht. Um, he's 70 years young and he'll be spending the next 45 years sailing Indonesian waters. <clears throat> With this work group, it is hoped that through education and soft persuasion, education and soft persuasion, we can eliminate avoidable incidences and hopefully reduce the need for regulatory measures. Now I'm going to start my presentation now. Humble beginnings, slide number one. My sea adventure started with my first sampan ride at Changi Beach in 1964. I've been boating ever since. Today it gives me great pleasure to be at this Pleasure Craft Safety Forum to share my experiences. Now I'll be sharing stories with you, all my personal experiences and how I came about being engaged in pleasure boating. And I still am boating right up to today. I still own a 26 foot uh, Grady White catamaran and I try to go out to sea at least once every week. Anyway, that's not a picture of me. Uh. That was the only slide I could find on Google. <laughs> Uh, but that was exactly the sampan that I took in 1964. Cost a couple of cents to rent it out for the whole day. And we would pedal off to a kelong, tie off to the kelong, and catch passe passe. <clears throat> Topic for this morning is observance of good seamanship. First, a collection of first principles. Now, when I say first principles, I mean it's first principles are the act of stripping a process down to the core fundamentals 
and then building up from there, my focus will be on pleasure crafts. These are the six first principles that my team and I have collated, have assembled. We hope that they will serve as a visual reminder in the form of a poster to trigger an attitude of safety at sea, especially amongst recreational boaters. Now, the first of these principles is observance of good seamanship. Explain has, I respect the sea, and sea and fellow seafarers, I practice boating etiquette. By the way, if the term boating etiquette is foreign to some of you, um, I actually bought this book uh, called Boating Etiquette about 25 years ago. And Terence reminded me that I probably bought it in Kaohsiung, uh, Taiwan, in many of our travels there. And uh, there's, it's a wealth of knowledge, teaches you a lot of common sense, which is what observance of seamanship is all about. But it, as you and I know, common sense ain't all that common. So we have to learn. <clears throat> Second of these principles is know before you go. We believe that knowledge, skills, and attitudes, I'm going to repeat that again, knowledge, skills, and attitudes with lots of experience are core to boating safety. Acquiring them will help you know before you go boating. I will elaborate on these principles with stories. Now, I'm not going to go through the other four principles. I will go through one by one as I share with you my personal stories. Let's start with observance of good seamanship. Now, that's a picture of um, East Coast Beach in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, that's where I kept my 18-foot sampan. And just on the right, that's the picture of the East Coast Beach where the sampans are kept today. The year was 1975. My first boat was an 18-foot wooden sampan that I bought and parked at the East Coast Beach. I knew absolutely nothing about boats and engines. I was at the very raw stage of, and this is a dangerous stage, huh? I, was, I was at the stage of, I don't know what I don't know, so I fear nothing. Fortunately, a local fisherman named Uncle Lim took me under his wing and taught me the basics. I learned on the job. Those days, all the sampans were parked on the beach above the high water mark. Launching and recovery was done manually, and everybody there would automatically help. It was an unwritten rule, a sort of seafarer's spirit that I followed without question. So the moment a sampan came back from fishing, everybody would rush there and help him pull it up, including the engine. Now, there was one thing I learned from the fishermen there and the boaters there, was this frequent message they keep on telling me. They say, look out for Angin Barat. That's called the Sumatras or squalls. These winds will come in the pre-dawn hours and whip up a storm that will capsize a small sampan, and I experienced that firsthand. Story goes like this. It was a dark and stormy night. This morning was a pretty dark and stormy morning also. Four o'clock in the morning, the wind suddenly picked up. It all of a sudden grew chilly. There was a signal to say that the Sumatras were coming, especially off Bado area. My tiny sampan got tossed up and down in the seas that were building up. Huge waves started um, forming, and then the rains came. My little four-horsepower Avinrood engine sputtered and finally died. The fuel line was sucking in air. I had to use my oars to get back to shore. Just before I hit the beach, a huge wave came and tossed me onto the beach with me inside the sampan. Luckily, I was not alone. Other fishermen had suffered the same fate. They came to my aid and dragged the boat with me inside up the beach. I huddled under a tree, shivering and waiting for the morning to come. This experience taught me a lot. Never underestimate the fury of the sea, especially if you're in a small boat. Watch the weather, respect, 
fellow voters, be humble and ask for help. Be courteous always. In later years when I joined the Navy, I learned the meaning of my experiences summed up in a single phase. It's simply put, observance of good seamanship. I respect the sea, described as I respect the sea and fellow seafarers, I practice voting etiquette. So that's lesson number one. Observance of good seamanship. Basically, using your kidney. <coughs> well, the second principle, first principle is know before you go. I joined the Navy in 1978. The slogan was join the Navy and see the world. And so I did. But instead of sailing to exotic destinations like Hawaii or Tahiti or even the Philippines or Indonesia, uh, my first trip in 1979, we sailed to Cochin, Colombo, Djibouti, and Sudan. And I'm proud to say that two of my fellow seafarers are actually with me this morning. Uh, we sailed together in an LST, traveled about 2,200 nautical miles, and finally reached Djibouti. Would you take a stand, Mr. Krishnan? I just had to do this. So that's one of my fellow Steve Harold. The other one is Mr. Donald Kratt. Okay, Donald, thanks. Anyway, those days knowing where you were at sea and where you were going was not so simple. We had a Deca radar. It worked most of the time. We had Loran, uh, which is radio fixing aids. Never worked since the first day I went on board the ship. And then we had the sextant. That was the only reliable source of navigation that we had. En route to Djibouti, 2,200 nautical miles away via the Arabian Sea, we caught a massive storm. And this storm actually lasted for the entire stretch of our journey there. It was about sea state eight, 65 knots of wind, uh, more than 120 kilometers per hour. We couldn't take sun sights, star sights, and moon sights for about 12 days. Now, those days, the sextant was the only instrument we had to take fixes in the open ocean. So after 12 days of no sights, we were lost. But if we, if we, if we could take a sight, once you took a fix, then you charted it on your, on your chart, you drew a track, did, did reckoning, predicted your position, based on date reckoning, until the next fix was established, which we didn't have for the next 12 days. So after 12 days, we didn't know exactly where we were, but we continued heading west towards the Gulf of Aden. And one day, when we were not too far away from the Gulf of Aden, and so we thought, we saw a passing ship. And we were very excited. We went on Channel 16, we called up the passing ship, got the name using our binos, and we call up the captain of the ship and says, could you give us your lead and long position? Guess what was the response? We were going to ask you the same thing. <laughs> Both of us were as lost as ever. Anyway, that's, that's how it was back then. Today, all that is absolute history. Global positioning system, chart plotters, have changed navigation forever. Today, I know where I am, where I'm going. I use a chart plotter. I even have navigation apps on my mobile phone. Now, that's the navigation app that I have on my mobile phone. I use Navionics. It's almost impossible to get lost at sea nowadays with GPS and chart plotters, unless, of course, the battery runs out. After having gone through an era of taking bearings and fixes to fix the ship, and it's really cumbersome, one section fix, 45 minutes of calculations. After having gone through that, I cannot understand why anyone would save money on a chart plotter or on a Navionics app. Because with that, you know exactly where you are all the time. You'll know where you are, where you're going, I use charts and a chart plotter. I have navigation apps on my handphone. 
I recognize local islands, buoys, and beacons. So that's point number two. Know before you go. Very heavy emphasis on navigation. Third, first principle. We certainly have one of the busiest harbors in the world. More than a thousand ships at any one point come in and out of Singapore waters. My next story is actually uh, one of my fishing expeditions off Halsburg Lighthouse. Again, everything happens at four o'clock in the morning when it's stormy. So this was four o'clock in the morning. I was on board a 28-foot center console with a single engine off Halsburg Lighthouse. Earlier in the morning, earlier in the day, we had lost our anchor, got stuck under the reef, and then now we are just drifting off Halsburg Lighthouse. Still catching fish and waiting for the morning to come so we could sail back to Singapore. Five o'clock in the morning, one by one, each of us kind of dozed off, which is a bad thing, including me. I must have dozed off for about five minutes or so I thought. When I woke up, I had the shock of my life. All I saw, this was off Hausberg, 28-foot vessel, right? So when I sort of got off, woke up from my little five-minute slumber, all I saw was complete pitch black. No moon, no stars, no backscatter of shore lights, just pitch black. So I thought, ah, the moon has set it. I got the shock of my life when I heard the sound of an engine. I was actually looking at the freeboard of a merchant ship that was painted black, of course, right? And it was only a couple of yards from me. And that ship hadn't seen me at all. <clears throat> a few seconds later, I sud all of a sudden I saw it. The wake of the ship. And then the moon came out, the stars came out, and the backscatter of shore lights. I was only a couple of yards away. And then I realized one thing, I had failed to keep a lookout. Big lesson. And if you can't see the bridge of the ship, they suddenly can't see you. You know, many months later, in 2003, at that same stretch of sea of Horsburg Lighthouse, a merchant ship collided with a Navy patrol vessel. Unfortunately, there were four fatalities. So keeping a lookout, really important. So now whenever I'm out on a boat, I automatically keep a vigilant lookout. I take bold and early action to avoid collision. I especially make sure I don't impede the safe passage of ships along fairways. I never insist my right of way when it comes to merchant ships. If I can't see the bridge, they certainly can't see me either. <coughs> Pause for one. Slide. Fourth principle, your boat is supposed to keep you above water and it's so comfortable when you're dry. But if your boat ever sinks, you better stay afloat. When in doubt, put on a life jacket. If your boat has capsized but is still afloat, better to stay with the boat and wait for rescue to come. It's easier to spot a boat with a single, uh, e easier to spot a boat than a single head bobbing in the water. So stay afloat, when in doubt, put on a life jacket. Infants, I personally feel that for infants 12 years and below, make it compulsory for them to put on a life jacket. Let's talk a bit about maintenance. Now, this was the biggest scare that I had when it came to maintenance. Huh? I describe maintenance or explain maintenance as this. My boat is my life raft. I service it regularly. Unlike ships and bigger mega yachts or super yachts with lifeboats, the boat, a boat or pleasure craft has only got life boys and life jackets. So better maintain your boat. The biggest scare I experienced was actually flooding. I was out fishing. This time I was in Singapore waters. On the boat itself, I have what we call the live bait well. It's a sports fishing boat. So the live bait well would pump seawater into a tank and it will run continuously to keep the bait alive. So we use live prawns and tambans and all that 
for fishing. Again, I don't know why my story is as such, but true story. This again happened at about four or five o'clock in the morning. We were fishing overnight off one of the southern islands. And uh, I suddenly realized that A, the, the boat seems to be listing to port. Can't be, I was on board a catamaran. And uh, the list became more and more pronounced. I said, something is very wrong. Normally, if there's water in the bilges, the float switch would activate and then they'll pour the water out. But this time, the pumps were silent and I didn't hear any water being discharged. So a lot of things were running through my head. I quickly opened up the bilge hatch and to my horror, the port bilge pump was flooded. I didn't understand why. But the first thing I did was I went to the console panel manually activated the port bilge pump, and thank God, the bilge pump worked. I didn't know whether the hull had been breached. Numerous thoughts went through my head, wondering why the bilge pump didn't activate, and most importantly, where was that water coming from? After much confusion and checks, I found the culprit. You wouldn't believe it. It was a live bait well. You see, the light well brings water from the sea into the boat. There was a hose clip from the bilge pump to the light well. And unfortunately, this was a very poor quality hose clip that I put on, not like this particular one that I have here. And over the years, the hose clip had rusted through and it had broken. So instead of pumping water into the light well, the light well pump was pumping it into the bilges. What a scare that was. I switched off the bait pump, emptied the water in the bilges, and when I got back to shore, I changed all my hose clips. Finally, a commitment to safety. As a skipper, of my, as a skipper the safety of my boat, crew, and guests, and the environment is my responsibility. I always tell the crew, and guests to keep a lookout and inform me when we're in close quarter situations. I tell them where the life jackets are stored and to put one on if they can't swim. I even tell them where to put their shoes. I do it intentionally so that my guests know that they're on board a boat, they're not a passenger in a car, and that guests are expected to help the skipper. So they quickly realize that there are rules to observe in a boat and they help me along especially when it comes to lookout. So commitment to safety, I'm gonna repeat that again. As a skipper, the safety of my boat, crew and guests and the environment is my responsibility. Now there is a saying, when the sea is calm, every boat has a great captain. Unfortunately, that doesn't, we don't have those conditions all the time. And I like this saying, a good seaman weathers a storm he cannot avoid, and avoids the storm he cannot weather. So ladies and gentlemen, in summary, no activity and no individual exists for the primary purpose of being safe. We exist so we live, so we experience, and so we have fun in this, life, in this short lifetime of ours. Sensible people understand that risk is part of living and that no amount of compliance, rules and regulations, restrictions and prohibitions will ever eliminate the inherent dangers that come from going out to sea in a boat. A good seaman weathers a storm he cannot avoid and avoids a storm he cannot weather. Remember that. Nobody, not even an authority, should ever claim to care more about your safety than you. In the end, no amount of compliance can replace the role of personal responsibility. And while governments and associations have a role to play in eliminating as much risk as possible from recreational boating activities, safety is ultimately our responsibility. Nobody should be more concerned about your safety on the water than you. The reality is quite obvious. On the water, out there, in the open ocean, nobody is watching 
over you to tell you that you're being unsafe. And I've never come across a captain that didn't know what he was doing, but he was doing it right. Have you? Hence the mantra, safety begins with me, says it all. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. On behalf of the MPA, the Singapore Powerboat Association, the Singapore Boating Association, the Singapore Maritime Academy, and the Singapore Sailing Federation, I thank you for your presence here, and thank you for listening. <laughs>